but in my uh, looking through scripture and my interactions with you all, I, I have to say tonight's passage, or two passages in one, I don't know that I found a passage that is so relevant to the hour to hour and daily life of an undergraduate student on campus. I actually don't think that I've, I've I don't know that I found a passage that, um, at least as I'm seeing, uh, you know, life on campus, on the campuses from which you hail through your eyes, I don't know, at least pastorally speaking, again, it's been a long time since I was an undergrad, that, but I don't know that I've encountered a text that has been so, um, dare I say it, relevant to what you all uh, have to contend with, what you all look forward to enjoying, what you all uh, struggle with uh, in terms of campus life in the places where you live and move and have your being. And uh, I think it was like three or four years ago, this moved me actually to do a year-long series on First and Second Thessalonians, which was an interesting exercise. Um, but there was something about these two texts that are very similar um, uh, with, with a, a variation of a sort. Um, that talks about uh, work as your worship unto God. If, if you're a senior, or if you've been around a little bit, you're, you're going to hear some things that are pretty familiar, and I don't want to—I don't want to beat a dead horse in a manner of speaking. So I, I will say some of those things. But uh, we believe that work is actually your worship unto God. If we're going to talk about worship, like Christians, I don't know, uh, owe it back to God as only a debt of gratitude, not earning our salvation, right? If we're going to talk about worship um, uh, as giving him praise and, and honor that, that is due uh, his name, we can talk about all sorts of things, many of which have already kind of risen to the surface in the series of conversations, if you will, that I've been trying to have uh, over the last several weeks. Um, but do you realize that um, work as part and parcel of your worship is not just a... a a minority report, a, a, a small portion of what it is that you owe to God as a follower of Jesus. Uh, it is uh, the main component, if you will. Um, and um, I've got quotes, I do, you know, little phrases. But to, to turn it a little bit in a different direction, uh, your sanctuary for worship unto God, it's not church. Okay? It's not. It's your campus. Okay, so when you go to church on Sunday morning, whichever one of the churches, you, one of which is literally called sanctuary, I understand that. I'm not picking on them. They just chose the word. That's their fault, not mine. <laughs> okay, but when you go to church, you, I under, you understand you step over a threshold, right? Excuse me. You step over the threshold from the world on the one hand into worship of God on the other. Right? Wrong. <laughs> Sure, there's literal spatial changes from the outside to the inside, from outside the walls of the church into the walls, of the, from outside the, the gathering of the saints on the one hand to you know, inside the public worship of God in explicit ways around scripture and song and prayer, confession of sin and, and all these other things, uh, communion, baptism. That's true in a sense. Uh, but really what we mean when we, when we talk about worship as a thoroughgoing historic concept of, uh, of the Christian faith, Okay, worship is what people do, you know, 24-7, 365. And the fact of the matter is, most of what you do isn't singing with your hands held high, clapping, you know, with, the, with some slides on the wall. <laughs> most of what you do, 24-7, 365, 25, 8, 357, <laughs> if you're at RISD, right? Just kidding. Okay, anyway, <laughs> John's like, wait a minute, I work. Right, most of what you do, has nothing to do with stepping over the threshold into the literal, whatever, the square footage of the church facility that you enter. Far from it. Most of what you do is just living your lives on campus. And when we talk about worship, when we talk about work as worship unto God, um, it's just another way of saying that if all of it belongs to him. Our whole lives um, belong to him. And who are we to take that away from him uh, any more on Sunday morning than we would Monday through Friday and then again on Saturday. 
Your sanctuary for worship to God isn't the church. And if that's what you think, you really got to dial that back. It's campus. It's your campus. And it begs the question, do you worship God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might? Okay, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, and then we'll jump to second in a bit. <clears throat> now concerning brotherly love, you have no need <clears throat> for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that is indeed, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more, more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Skipping forward to 2 Thessalonians 3.6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Uh, how does that fit for size? <laughs> uh, your sanctuary right, is not the church into which you step on a Sunday morning. It is the campus where you live and move and have your being. Um, one of the things that struck me from this text early, early on, I don't know, what, maybe it was six or seven years ago, it was actually in the midst of preparing for a senior seminar around the time of March or April. Um, I mean, all the seniors have been through the seniors. So I, can't, I can't exactly remember which seminar it was, uh, which group of seniors it was that I was working with on this. Um, but it struck me how unevangelical this text is because it's literally commanding us, mind your own business. <laughs> and one, one of the things of evangel, no, right? The, the, the responsibility, the burden, um, the privilege is ours to go and share the wealth, to go and sow the seed, to go and reach out to our neighbors, to go and reach out to to first years, uh, to new people, to bring in those who are cast out, uh, to love the disenfranchised, to bring into the center those who are marginalized. And, 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 and that's the, the thrust of the gospel, and we have to take that very seriously. And that is a part of evangelicalism that is wholly biblical and honors Jesus' teaching and his uh, intentions for what his church, um, for what his followers in the church are to do. But, I mean, have you ever thought about it the other way? I mean, there is a sense in which you, you've got this kind of evangelical man's burden on your shoulder. And really, the, the mode of outreach that the community of believers unto Jesus, we may be talking about Jesus' glory and his grace. We may be talking about the gospel, but really all we're trying to do is brush the chip off our shoulder or somehow kind of... Um, cover over the blemishes of guilt and shame, evangelical guilt uh, within uh, that we've received this, you know, awfully, you know, terribly precious thing that how do I make good on that uh, for God? Um, the Bible is not so simple-minded. It's not so um, naive as to think that um, it, you can receive and be a recipient of this precious gift and just kind of take it in without 
some kind, without some kind of process, without some kind of a, a process of relationship in terms of um, um, thinking through your motivations, thinking through um, what it means to apply these things to our lives, yours and mine, and alongside just uh, uh, the significant thrust of scripture which talks about mission, there's also a part of it where, you know, in Christianity, what we've received, uh, we have to do right by and obey and comply with in terms of living quietly, minding our own business, not causing trouble. The interesting thing about the Thessalonians, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. I mean, if I were to tell, you know, you guys, you have no need, that's great, right? I, there's some affirmation. Eddie apparently is older, wiser, patient, and all these things like that. <laughs> you know, I appreciate that, Denny. <laughs> I much more like to say, you know, it's more just the, the, influ the collective influence of RUF, right? Um, so if I were to say it, yeah, okay, you know, great. You know, Eddie really thinks that, that much of me, and that's really encouraging, right? Well, what if the Apostle Paul were to say this of you? <laughs> Who literally met Jesus on the road to Damascus, was struck blind, and then received his sight, and that was a part of his conversion, and then started to pen the very words of God like they would carry, I mean, they didn't know, I guess, that his words would carry forward in Scripture for millennia to come. But literally, the Apostle Paul is encouraging them. Everything that God has taught us to do, you are doing that, and more so. So just keep going. Right, that's, that's what, it's, it's almost a throwaway. Do this more and more, right before verse 11. At the tail end of verse 10, do this more and more. And then he says, but. There is a but. There is a but. Christian community doesn't just kind of begin, uh, the beginning, the middle, and end of Christian community and fellowship isn't just loving one another. There are pitfalls. Um, if you have a community that's so strong in these things and, and so strong in reaching out to their neighbors throughout the city of Thessalonica, they're pitfalls. You know, Christians who start to kind of come off meddlesome, who are poking around in people's business and prying. People who stop working for a variety of reasons. Um, people are like, come on, don't you see? I love you. Don't you see? Don't you see? <laughs> it gets a little creepy. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Now leave me alone. <laughs> Can I just cut my grass? <laughs> no, we got to talk. I want to talk with you. And Paul's like, hold on. At what point did we allow gospel, the gospel to let common courtesy and civility go out the window? And with the entirely important truths of evangelism, mission, one anothering, um, loving one another within the community of faith, loving one another without, right? Um, uh, out, loving loving our, our friends um, who are not Christians, he says some very plain, very plain, live quietly. Live quietly. It almost sounds like a contradiction, right? A contradiction in terms. Mind your own affairs. Do your job. Don't worry about your friends. Just do your job. Literally, like your nine to five job, whatever it is that you do, you know, clocking in, clocking out on a daily basis, and do it hard. Work at it really hard. Fourthly, and this is where we get a little bit more of that what Paul is talking about that could be interpreted as mere social etiquette, but I say far from it. Rather than just kind of this uh, aggressive, um, upfront kind of outreach mentality, what he's talking about is, which is evangelistic, is reputational, right? What's the fourth thing? Be well thought of by outsiders. Don't worry so much if they're getting whether or not you love them wholesale and, can co and, and are able to go deep and vulnerable with you. Don't worry about those things. Mind your own business. Just be well thought of and let the opportunities come as they will. As the shoe drops, catch it. But don't be so worried about being the hard-nosed, kind of going out there and drumming up opportunities for yourself to share the gospel. Simply be well thought of. Fifth, be dependent on no one. 
this business of loving one another, you can kind of imagine it, maybe tip, tipped over to the point where they were sharing everything, and it's like, hey, brother, you, you borrowed my MacBook Pro the other week. Can I have it back now? It's been seven days. <laughs> it's a little unusual, right? Eddie, I don't know. I borrowed, you know, I let Caleb borrow my MacBook Pro, and I haven't, I haven't seen it in two weeks. He said he'd give it back at the end of one. I was just trying to love my brother in Christ, <laughs> right? So these things have to be held in tension. Uh, we have to not let ourselves be monopolized by the culture of evangelicalism. But I'll tell you, I mean, have you ever talked to anybody about what they think of Christians and what they perceive tend to be meddlesome? What do non-Christians, either from, you know, who, are, who used to go to the church or have never darkened the doors of the church, suspect of pastors? Oh, are you going to ask me about my personal life? <laughs> right, that's, that's the first thing on, uh, usually on people might like, oh, are we going to open up a time of confession right now, uh, pastor? Uh, we're perceived to be meddlesome. We're, we're perceived to be busy bodies, busy all the time, yet accomplishing nothing relative to the rest of the world. There is a cultural overlay that I think has run amok, and we have to be careful of that. And I'll tell you, in terms of conversations interfellowship, I am not. I have not been one to pull any punches. I tend to think that our interfel the, the, the things that are pitched and, and bandied about in terms of interfellowship activities tend to smell a little bit of just this meddlesome, busy. But I, I have that suspicion. If you're on LTS and you've been on LTS some bit, you know that I have that bit of does this pass the smell test of 1 Thessalonians 4. Well, we haven't talked about it in a while. But I'm not necessarily, I'm not earning it very many friends. Uh, I haven't earned my, very many friends um, in recent years trying to bring um, these things up. But you have to understand, Paul worked tirelessly, and that was Second Thessalonians 3. It's saying the same thing, but the, the variation on the theme really is Second Thessalonians 3. you got to kind of clue in. He starts to use the, the language, now we command you. Why would he do that? Right? Before it was now concerning the brother love. You have no, no, right, no, no need for anybody to write to you. Now we command you, brothers, right? What does that suggest to you happened between the time that they received 1 Thessalonians 4 <laughs> and the time Paul went to write 2 Thessalonians 3? They didn't listen. They didn't listen. The problems kept going, uh, either on a plateau style or, or they got worse. Um, the, the problems expanded and multiplied. And he says, now, all right, let's get real. And he says, remember what I did when I was among you, I didn't ask you for a thing. And ministry was my night job and I had my day job. Or ministry was my day job and I moonlighted as a bartender just to make ends meet, right? <laughs> because I didn't want to put a, whatever the, whatever the night jobs are that were available in ancient Thessalonica, I don't know. Um, so that we might not be a burden to any of you. Verse 8. Paul said, I worked tirelessly, not as a busybody, but because I cared for you all. We didn't have time for anything else. We didn't have time for anything else. Have you ever experienced competitiveness in the midst of academics? Have you ever wondered uh, how your friends were doing? Or have you ever felt the pressure of your friends wondering how you were doing in that same class that you were all there together with? This text is perf perfect. Live quietly. Mind your own affairs. It's a, in the vernacular, it's, you know what? Keep your head down. Don't worry about it, anybody else. Just do the best you can. And do it as unto Jesus, because our work is our worship to God. Your sanctuary is not where you go on a Sunday morning. It's everywhere, essentially, that you are. Sunday uh, through Saturday. This is a great thing with regard to competitiveness. How can, uh, within the community of faith, Within uh, our UF, within our fellowship, people who have the same classes, who are striving to love one another in the midst of, oh, I don't know, principles of design, freshman year, was the <laughs> Christians who are just trying to slave it away in your seminars together, and you're, you're, you're trying to love one another, but you know, pretty quickly, like, you know, let's say there are five of you in a class, and four of you know the one just... They're not having as much trouble as the rest of you, right? And you just want to love that person to death, don't you? <laughs> the four of you just want to do everything you can to band together, gather around this fifth person, and just 
show them all of the tender love and care for just all the burdens that they're, right? Um, when we want to love one another, it just get, it starts to get kind of gray. And, and, and if we approach it with kind of overly simplified models of what relationship and um, human sociability look like, um, it gets, it runs amok. And so this text is perfect in terms of what it looks like to mind our own business, all the while at the same time loving one another. Um, have you ever gotten stuck in a group doing a group project, right, with one or more members who did nothing and left the rest of you to fend for yourselves and push the thing forward? Is that the sort of thing that would frustrate you? Is that the sort of thing that would eat away at you and you felt like you were being put upon? One of Paul's very straightforward censures here is those who do not work, let them not eat and don't associate with them. <laughs> yeah. You can try and dull the edges. You can try and offer qualifications. You can give the person a couple chances or one chance as a matter of grace, but he's basically saying everybody's got to do their part. No one gets to sponge off of another. Um, certainly not for religious reasons. This goes to why what is going on is probably going on. Um, the, Th the Thessalonians had an overactive imagination with regard to the end times and Jesus' return uh, from heaven to renew the heavens and the earth. He really did. And uh, what some of them were saying, it was a small faction, but it was significant enough to gain a hearing in Paul's, both of Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. They said, oh, Jesus is coming back tomorrow. He could come back tonight for all. I'm going to the spring break concert. Finals, whatever, group project, Chris will take care of that for us. And within the community of faith, what, they were, what, what a faction of them were saying is, you all are just wasting your time. Because whatever it is we manage to accomplish in the few days we have left before Jesus comes back, I'm just going to have fun. Or I'm just going to kind of let it all just lie and wait until lounge at the beach. And Paul's saying, absolutely not. The work that we do, we do into eternity. In a sense, to usher in that which is eternal and to make straight the paths of God for Jesus' return. It says, live quietly, mind your own affairs, work hard, be dependent on no one. Uh, an extreme extension of this came up in Guy's family group recently in terms of being dependent on no one. Don't take out any loans, right? So there are strains of Christian thought, granted a minority report again, but there are strains of Christian thought that you may not take out debt. <laughs> yeah, interest bearing, something you ever have to pay back that can it, in, in, that should introduce certain dependencies that biblical, now, okay, so the Bible is not that extreme. Actually, there are plenty of other texts where it says um, issue debt. That's okay. So it's not, it's not kind of, it's certainly not my uh, position anyway, but there are Christians, and, and wisely so, who say, you know what, I'm not going to buy anything unless I can pay it all up front in cash, interestingly enough. But more, it's relationally. Um, uh, in the midst of loving one another, right, um, don't, don't, sponge don't sponge off people emotional, relational support. Hasn't Jesus given you all that you need? In fact, loving one another isn't meant to be just this trap door for codependence. Um, it's really interesting. All right, so there, there you have some features of the text. Um, um, and uh, I trust that it, that, that it helps you think through uh, it in a way. Um, Where am I going with this? Uh, one of the facts of the matter is, uh, when we talk about the campus as a sanctuary, right, uh, work as your worship, well, when it comes to life on campus, right, it's not just your classes, is it? That, co that, that, that costs you a lot on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, semester after semester as you go about living and moving and having your being on campus. It's not just, in fact, probably a lot of the stuff that might be most preoccupying, well, maybe now it's finals, right? 
But a lot of it has, other th has, has to do with other things, uh, not academic. Relationships, right? Living arrangements, diet, uh, health, co-curriculars. I'll have a small portion about this about RUF. Um, um, but uh, the, the work that you put in on campus is not just the work that you put in in classes. And in fact, often what takes a lot of the most energy is uh, work in relationships. Um, very specifically, this is that time of year where we look to kind of sew things up. What's the state of your relationships with other people? What's the quality of the friendships that you've carried through this year or not? What are the loose ends that you can work to sew up now? Prepare to do so over the next several weeks. We're winding down the ministry year, but there's still a lot of weeks left in the academic term for especially the Christians on a college campus to think in a mature and wise, deliberate and intentional way. What are the regrets that we carry individually with regard to one another? Uh, what, where, where, where is that need, uh, where is it that um, we are called of God to forgive and extend and offer forgiveness? Where do you know that you have a brother or a sister uh, in the community of faith that they have been seeking your forgiveness and you just said, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of busy right now. What are those things that you need to do to make sure to end the year well? And not just the seniors, because they're going away forever and never coming back. That's not true, but, you know, <laughs> largely graduation is a clean break. But still, what are the things you need to do now socially to transition things, leave as well as possible this year behind in preparation for the start of another great year next fall? Um, have you thought about it? And I think this is a great time for Christians who are growing in, 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 in grace, who are growing in their relationship with Jesus to think, what happened to that friendship that I had last semester? <laughs> Where did that person go? And what can I do now? In the spirit of you know, a, a, a sanctified self-sufficient, what can I do now to make sure that with all my friends, I can end things on a better footing, right, than the one in which right now things are established. Um, especially for seniors, this is really important. There's a lot of nostalgia, but especially in the midst of the preoccupations and the distractions and the frenetic pace of year-end things, trying to wrap it all up, do final performances, concerts, uh, senior shows, um, final, so certainly final exams, a thesis, presentations, and all these other things. In the midst, can you, can, you, can you stop yourself a little bit? As your worship unto God, to think about that estranged person in your life. That maybe it's been for a couple of years since, since you, you all were freshmen, and you just sort of parted ways um, quietly, letting it go by the wayside. Is that really what Jesus has called you to do with your estranged friends on campus? And, and, and can't you see, who cares whether you go to church on Sunday? Who cares how much you enjoyed the sermon and the music? Who cares whether you enjoyed fellowship with other Christians on a Sunday morning? If you know you, you have an estranged relationship or several of them, out and about, especially if they're non-Christians. What good? What good is it that when you bring your gift to the altar and still you know there is an offense that has been rendered that stands between you and even just one other person? At that point then, folks, attendance in church, RUF, it's just perfunctory. And you've gotten it all wrong. You have not entered the sanctuary of God. <laughs> you've abandoned it. The sanctuary for worship unto God that we all inhabit is not the church on a Sunday morning. 
it's your campus. And I have to plead with you. It's really easy to sort of let it slide Sunday afternoon through Saturday night and then just kind of reactivate it on Sunday morning. Or if you will, call it, I'll tell you, RUF, is it the church or the campus? Uh, right? <laughs> I'm kind of leaving RUF out of this, right? We meet on campus. We are not the church. Well, I'm an ordained minister. I'm not like, I'm not faculty. I'm not an administrator. This is not a co-curricular activity in the strictest sense like athletics or intramural sports or the race club team or the race car team, okay? We kind of do both. Uh, but the best thing I can say is uh, my commitment is to be here with you all as much as possible, <laughs> to, to, to live with you as much as possible, right? I mean, I'm not going to show up on your couch tomorrow morning or anything. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I've got a life. Don't worry. But for me, as sort of an operator behind the lines, a little bit anyway, uh, both me and Max, my wife too, you know, to participate with you in the places where you live and where you must worship God. That's why I do this, and I'm not a parish minister. Because I, I, I much prefer this rather than living in the cloistered walls of a, of a church facility on a Sunday morning, which has its benefits and its strengths and other, other things. But I'm talking about work and life on campus as your worship unto God. Okay. Um, uh, so what conversations do you need? Have you thought about it? Have you toiled and labored over those conversations? Oh, I, you know, I'd rather work on my, my design project because that, that needs more work than my relationship. <laughs> Just easier to deal with. You don't have to have any conversations with people when I'm doing, when I'm doing in the studio. <clears throat> but can you spend some time on that? Um, as hard as it is uh, in your ID studio, as important as it is to pass that exam and to fulfill the group project um, with a stellar review, with stellar results, as meaningful as it would be to you to be a straight-A student this semester, this year, all four years of your college experience, as meaningful as these things are to you, okay? Um, can sewing up the loose ends of relationships be just as worthy of your attention, of your devotion, of your commitment? Can it be? Isn't it? Right? And this is the small portion of RUF. As hard as you work, uh, certainly 24-7 in your classes, as important and as meaningful as these things um, are to you to be uh, successful, to be known reputationally as successful students, uh, as well-rounded, right? <laughs> well-rounded undergraduates, if that's something that you aspire to. Can you care about RUF? The same. Not 40 hours a week, not 80 hours a week, anywhere from 2 to 12 hours a week. Can you care about that? Work as hard during those hours as you do everywhere else um, as you love and long for. If that's the challenge of leadership, uh, that's what we um, put to our leaders new and old as we're transitioning. Very particular. do you expect other people, now if, if you are a leader and have been for some time, uh, do you expect and have you asked other people to do your work for you? Very important question. How is it that we go about delegating? How is it that we go about sharing responsibility? How is it we go about, uh, I don't know, not hogging, you know, all of the leadership responsibility? Um, have you asked, do you expect other people to do your work for you in RUF, um, are you the type to commit to do, doing something and then last minute drop out because you're too busy? Well, don't. This says, work hard, mind your own affairs, live quietly, be well thought of by others, including other Christians, right? As well as friends from outside of the Christian community. Be dependent on no one. Do your job. Uh, a good rule of thumb for leaders, uh, I say anyway, is whatever you ask someone to do, you better make sure before you ask them you're willing to do it yourself um, at least as much, if not more so. So anything that I stand to ask any of our next year's leaders to do, it's not anything I haven't done already uh, in certain ways, uh, maybe even more so uh, than I'd ask LTS or family group leaders next year to do, but um, I, I, don't, I don't ask leaders to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. 
So uh, there you have it. Um, th this is a, there, there's just a lot to take in. This is the sense in which I'm saying, I, I don't know that I've, I've, I've encountered other texts. and um, I'm not just this like thoroughgoing, knowledgeable person about Scripture. I'm growing in my knowledge of, of the counsel of God in the Bible, but I, I don't know that I've seen texts that are really relevant to instruct us as we go about uh, our way in campus life, and, it, and it, it begs us to consider that the sanctuary of God that we inhabit as to worship unto him has nothing to do with Sunday mornings and crossing over that threshold into the church facility. It has everything to do with how we comport ourselves and our conduct, that we do everything that we can to make sure it is becoming of the name of Jesus in the eyes of anyone and everyone with whom we rush, rub shoulders Sunday afternoon through Saturday night. That's the challenge. That really is. If this is something that you've not thought about with regard to Christian worship, this is what we believe, folks. And this is why I, I believe in a thoroughgoing music ministry. This is why I believe in a thoroughgoing ministry of prayer and Bible study and sermons, not just to consume people's attention as much as possible in however many RUF meetings that leaders stand to do and attend on a, on a weekly basis, but to help us see everything that we do on campus through the lens of Scripture. That whether we're in the midst of an explicit RUF meeting or it's just out and about somewhere in Andrew's common, Commons eating pho and commiserating over the last math exam, what, 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 do we do all these things as the Corinthian letters, as unto God. If we don't, then our activities here really are rendered perfunctory. They really are. And uh, why we do leadership in this, leadership isn't like, leadership isn't like Donald Trump administration leadership, right? The, the, the political part of it, the, the decision-making influence, I mean, there's, we don't have like a, a trillion dollar budget. We don't. <laughs> there's just not a lot of vested interests in terms of Christian leadership. What I really mean to that, and this is just full disclosure here to kind of open up the hood of RUF a little bit to you, leadership is just a foil for me to be in close contact with a, with a, with a smaller set of people within, within our community, helping you think through your lives wholesale relative to the desire, the intentions, and the plan of God through his gospel. Your sanctuary is not the church. It's this place that we are right now, you know, minus the explicit stuff of RUF and, and Jesus. We don't come into worship in the community of faith. The minute you step out, you go to worship in your classes, in your dorms, in your suites, in your seminars, lectures, studios, labs, on-campus jobs, <laughs> relationships, the casual and the informal things. And if you want to tell me what's most transformational about time in college, I don't remember a single thing any of my faculty said. I don't. <laughs> I don't remember a single thing any of my TAs taught me. I mean, maybe a thing or two are here, you know. Right? Certainly they bore influence on me. They, they expanded my knowledge of uh, Greek history and modern European history, classics major. Certainly, I became more skillful at Latin and Greek and Biblical Hebrew and international relations and utopian, utopian thought. The history of utopias and utopianism <laughs> in Western civilization was my senior spring slide course. Um, I mean, certainly, I, I expanded my knowledge. But what you really remember is those late night conversations, the unplanned things with a, a close Christian friend, or not. When things got heated, when you fought, when, when things got really personal and you cried together, when things got really joyful and you just danced like you never would in front of real people, <laughs> other than whom you trusted and had the most confidence. These are the, these are the things that are uh, transformational and really meaningful, if you ask me, in terms of on-campus experience. And those are the things that Jesus longs for, for you, for his people. Jesus loves you wholesale, all of you, not just 9 to 11 on a Sunday morning or 
10 to 12 on a Sunday morning. Jesus loves you wholesale. He loves you at 3 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon. (laughs) He loves you at 4 a.m. on a Tuesday morning when you're cramming to get to the 9 a.m. hand-in deadline. He loves you when you do not even give him a thought in the, in the midst of that activity or that place where you know it has nothing to do with Christianity and with God. He loves you when you're in the center of Christian activity and, and all the verbiage of, of true religion and the love of Jesus. He loves you no differently one place than the next. He loves you no differently than when you're doing explicitly Christian things and evangelizing to your non-Christian friends. Then when you're just shooting pool in the bottom of the blue room, doing nothing in particular, watching the news on the TV. <laughs> Jesus' love for you never changes. It is completely wholesale. So why would we live any differently? <laughs> That's the idea. I understand there's a lot of practicality here. But here's the thing. A lot of you talk to me and be like, Eddie, that was a nice sermon, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with that. So here I am loading it right at the back end. All of the things that you have to do now ahead of you in terms of work as worship unto God, your sanctuary is the campus because Jesus loves you. You are a part of your campus. He loves your campus. (laughs) He loves your dorm as as ugly as Homer might be. (laughs) He loves your studios. He loves the place where you feel like he has sent you into the lion's den of stress and anxiety and frustration. He loves that group project because you are so frustrated by that person or those two people who just will not carry their weight and you have to do all that you can. You have appealed again and again to the TA and to the professor to release, to deliver you from purgatory to no avail. He loves you there as much as at winter conference or fall conference where we're singing our hearts out and beating the drums and playing mafia until 4 a.m. and falling asleep in the Saturday morning seminars thereafter. He loves you the whole way through. There's no difference in his love for you. (laughs) Would you expect anything less of God? (laughs) All these things sound like micromanaging nitty-gritty details. All I'm asking you to do is think about having that conversation, sewing up that loose end, thinking about that frustrating competitive thing going on among the Christians, right? That that life that, that aspires to live quietly, mind his or her own affairs, to work hard, be well thought of outsiders, and be dependent on no one, is that life that plugs into the unremitting, unrelenting, unconditional love of God 24-7, 365, 25-8, 366. (laughs) And is so enamored of God's never falling asleep regard, kindness, his kindness, his generosity, never ending, everlasting, always unto the end of the age. And so is able to live quietly, mind his own business, work hard, be well thought of by outsiders, and be dependent on no one. That's the sense in which I say, you know what? If you think church is your sanctuary, you got it wrong. And man, are you missing the grace of God? (laughs) Are you missing the very character, the all-consuming character of God? And he wants to embrace every part of you and your iCal <laughs> with his mercy, with his kindness, with his tender whispers of grace and compassion, as, as well as his loud cries of joy and adulation over you. Would you expect anything less of God And do you want anything less for yourself? Let's pray. Well, Father in heaven, if it's true for anybody in this room, especially true for me, uh, to think that church happens in a particular place, at a specific time, when you show up, outside of which, I'm just not sure, (laughs) outside of which it's easy for me to lose sight. 
to be not only forgetful, but just distracted by the visible realm, by all the, the, the experiences um, of life on a weekly basis from Sunday afternoon to Saturday night. Uh, far be it from me uh, to make so little, to, uh, to so diminish your grace and your glory, Father. Far be it from us as a community uh, to so diminish your, the very presence of the living God to a, a mere few hours on a Sunday morning or wherever else we might congregate as Christians to do Christian things. Far be it from us. Uh, but would you help us see more and more of who you are and what you are doing in and through us every minute of every day, whether we're asleep or whether we're awake, whether we're productive or in are particularly inactive, whether we're getting uh, results or falling short of the results that we want to get. You are God and there is no other, and we praise you. You are worthy of all honor and acclamation. Teach us, instruct us, show us how it is we are to um, give um, the school's from which we hail, the campuses on which we work and live and sleep and have friends and make enemies and everything in between. Uh, that that is our place of worship. Would you embolden us, give us the strength and the stamina to go and do the things that you have called us to do wholesale uh, for the glory of our risen King. Help us to have those conversations, to sew up loose ends, to mend anything that is broken in the way of relationships and fellowship with other Christians. Help us to be a people of good repute uh, before the watching world, to work hard. I pray for everyone here that they would be straight A students this semester, if it be your will. <laughs> Give us good grades. We plead with you, Lord of mercy. Have mercy on us. We know we're procrastinators. You know it better than we are. Have mercy on us. Give us good grades. Help us to eke it out. Encourage us by that so that we might be an encouragement to one another. Father in heaven, embolden us for the mission that we are to be dependent on no one but reliable for everyone who dares ask a question of the living God. Uh, give us those opportunities uh, as the shoes drop uh, to catch what you have pitched and to have late night conversation that might transform some from reprobation to salvation. Uh, Father, uh, forgive us of our sin. We know it well as well. Uh, free us for these things. And send us out. For here we are. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name we pray. Amen.